We're going to talk a little bit about the Cisco IOS. This is when we actually get into Cisco specific stuff. Um, device configuration, addressing schemes. Um, so we're going to talk about the Cisco IOS. So, um, and feel free to pull up the PowerPoint and follow along because I know once you get to about halfway down the room, you can't read this, right? I, mean, I, don't know, I can't. So, um, every computer requires an operating system to function. We know that, right? The operating system is the interface between the user and the hardware. So a networking device needs a networking operating system to function. So um, this can come in a couple different forms. There's the command line, which is what we're going to be dealing with in Cisco. Everything is command line, and that can be kind of different to get to used to, but um, hopefully the packet tracers that you'll be doing will kind of help that out a little bit. And then there's GUI, uh, the graphic user, user interface. So there's different components to this. There's the shell. That's the part that the user interacts with, whether it's command line or GUI. Then there is the kernel, and the kernel is the thing that communicates between hardware and software. And the hardware of the computer is, of course, the part you can kick, right? It's the physical piece um, that sits in front of you. So the purpose of the operating system on a PC is so that the user can use a mouse, click, right click, um, enter text or text-based commands, view output on a monitor. That's the classic OS that we know of and use every day. The Cisco iOS um, enables a technician to run, use the keyboard to run programs, enter text, enter commands, configurations. We're going to be doing a lot of that and viewing the output of that on the monitor. So like, was the command successful or not? Did you tap it in correctly and it's going to tell you what you missed? so that you have the opportunity to fix it. Um, all networking devices come with some sort of default iOS. Some of them you can configure, and some of them you can't. Um, in this case, we're going to be dealing with things we can configure. Um, and it's possible to upgrade the iOS version or the feature set in it. We refer, um, in the Cisco iOS, we call this console in uh, to create some sort of configuration on the device. There's different ways we access the Cisco IOS. So there's three big ways. One is a console. We call that a terminal connection. So you plug in a special cable and then you connect directly to it. So that's okay if you're in the room with it, right? But sometimes we're not in the room with it. So we use something like Telnet or SSH. Telnet is a way to do that over the internet, but Telnet is not secure. Everything that gets sent over a telnet connection is in plain text, which means if anybody intercepts that text, they can see exactly what's being typed in. So obviously that's probably not a good idea. So they came up with SSH, or Secure Shell. So it's like telnet. You can configure things from a different location, but everything is encrypted. So if somebody did intercept that data in some way, it wouldn't mean anything to them. It would just be scrambled up letters and numbers. Um, so that's the three different ways that we access uh, the Cisco IOS. Um, here's some examples of terminal emulation programs. This is the classic one pretty much everybody I know uses. It's called Putty. Um, and it's kind of got a little GUI that's set up to it. Um, but that is a way that you can terminal set up a session to console in. There's TerraTerm, which I think is defunct now. Uh, it does mention it, but I don't think it's used. Um, and then there is the secure CRT, which is used in Linux environments if you want to console in. There's different modes of operation. So a console connection has to be established before you can actually make any configuration. You have to authenticate and make sure that you're connected to the device and you're able to make changes to it before you can make any changes. So after you're console in, the tech has to uh, be able to navigate through various different command modes. We're going to talk about those command modes. To me, learning Cisco, that was the hardest part. And that's chapter two. So if you can get through that, the rest of it's going to be gravy. Because to me, figuring out what mode I was supposed to be in and why things weren't working was really frustrating until I figured it out. So the Cisco IOS, iOS uses this hierarchical structure um, on switches and routers. And here's a little video about that. Let me check the sound. So I'll
CL. Click on that, and then also click in the main window area. So now I have a PC and a switch. To simulate the initial configuration of Cisco switch, you first need the proper cable. I'll click on the connections icon, and the second connection over is the console cable. I'll click on the console cable, then on the desktop PC, choose the RS-232 serial port, click on it, then drag over to the 2960 switch, click on the switch, and then choose the console port. I now have a connection from the desktop PC to the 2960 series switch using a rollover or console cable. Once you have the serial cable running from your desktop PC to the switch console port, you'll need a terminal emulation program for the initial configuration of the Cisco switch. To do this, you click on the PC, click on the desktop tab, and these are your desktop applications. The terminal emulation program says terminal. If you click on it, you'll see the terminal configurations that you would need if you were using a real terminal emulation program like PuTTY or TerraTerm. You can see the bits per second, data bits, parity, stop bits, and flow control have already been configured for you. All you need to do is click OK. Now I have a terminal connection to the switch. I'll press enter to get started, and you can see that I have the switch command prompt available to me. This is how you will need to console into the switches and routers in Packet Tracer skills activities and Packet Tracer exams. For a quick alternative way of reaching a command line interface, you can click directly on the switches and routers, go to the CLI tab, and you can see that it also brings up a command line interface. Furthermore, you can increase the size of the font by going to Options, Preferences, Font, and changing the size of the CLI font. You can see that I've changed mine to 16 to make it easier to read for the video. video, we're going to be doing the whole rest of this class and, and most of your career at TSTC. We're going to be interfacing with that device, that switch, that router, that firewall, and entering in commands to configure it. Um, so here are the primary command modes, and again, to me, this is the part where it really got funny until I really did some packet tracers and got, got it in my head. There is user exec mode. That's kind of like logging into a computer with a standard user. You can't do everything. You can't change some administrative things. You can kind of look around and see what the configuration is like, check maybe what version the firmware is on the switch. You can do some things, but you can't really change anything. And that's user exec mode, a limited number of commands. You know you're in user exec mode when you see that greater than symbol. So what you see there, switch and router, that's the name of the device. You can change that, and we will do that in this chapter. But you're going to see the name of the device and then a greater than symbol. And that means you're in user exec mode. So if you try to type in a command that's for something that's administrative, it's going to yell at you. I mean, not, not physically, but it's not going to let you do it. It's going to give you an error message. And that was difficult for me to figure out, why doesn't that work? And most of the time, it was because I was in the wrong command mode. Now, privileged exec mode, or the privileged executive mode, is like logging in as an admin on um, a Windows computer. So you get all the commands, you can do all the management, you can do all the administration that you want to do because you're in the privileged mode, right? You have all the privileges. And that is uh, denoted by a number sign um, or an, a pound or a hashtag as you youngins call it. Um, whatever you call it, that is what denotes that you're in privileged exec, exec mode. Some more uh, command modes, there's global configuration mode. So if you want to configure the device, you have to first tell it, 
hey, I'm about to do things that configure the device, which makes sense, right? So if you come in and you're at user exec mode, or even when you go into your privileged exec where you could make changes, you have to say configure terminal, which means I'm going to configure the device that you see over at the left-hand side. So the command that you do that with is configure terminal. Now I will tell you, I am not, I'm a GUI person. I'm a clicky person. I'm not a keyboard command person. Um, I right click to copy and paste people. I'm telling you, I'm not a command person. So what I did is I got me uh, a spiral notebook and every single command that they listed or that I did, I wrote down what it was and what it did. And I kept that notepad with me all the time. And I looked over commands all the time. And every time I was going to go do a new packet tracer, I'd pull it out and I would use my own notes. Because for me, writing things down helps me remember it. So that might be something that you do because all these different commands can kind of get muddled over time. When we get into chapter six and seven and you're learning new ones every single week. Um, so that's just a piece of advice. So the very first one I would put on that list is configure terminal. Um, so for example, you, um, when you enter this configure terminal mode, you're gonna see the example changes to switch config, okay? So you're configuring the device name switch, okay? Um, so that affects the operation of the whole device. Um, there's different modes that come beyond that. So um, if you're doing configure terminal, you're changing the whole device. If you want to configure just an interface, then you want to use interface configuration mode. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, for line, if you want to configure things like the console, the SSH, the telnet, all the things that you use to get to the switch, so that you can configure it. We call that line configuration mode. So here's a little difference. You're gonna watch a short video of uh, them going through the different modes so you can see when they're used. Let's examine the iOS command modes in Packet Tracer. I'm using Packet Tracer 6.2 and I have a desktop PC with a console connection to a 2960 series switch. I'll click on the desktop PC, click on the terminal emulation program, and click OK, and you can see that I'm presented with a console command line interface. This is the Cisco iOS. I'll press enter on the keyboard to get started. Notice the command prompt here at the bottom. The Cisco iOS uses different command modes to establish different privilege levels for the users and different commands that are available in each command mode. For instance, the blinking cursor that you see right now and the word switch with the greater than sign indicates that I'm in user exec mode. User exec mode has very little privileges, but if I type enable and press enter, I'm presented with privileged exec mode. I can tell this because the prompt has changed from a greater than sign to a hash or pound sign. Privileged exec mode offers a higher privilege level for the user and more commands that are available. If I would like to go to a higher level, I can go into global configuration mode. I can reach global configuration mode by typing in configure terminal and pressing enter. And now I'm in global configuration mode, or global config mode. This is where most configurations of a switch or router will take place. There are also sub-configuration modes, like interface configuration mode. If I type interface VLAN 1 and press enter, I'm put into the interface sub-configuration mode. When you go through um, the chapter, there's going to be, it's going to explain a mode to you, and there'll be an activity where you can actually type in and use it, and it will check, they call it the syntax checker. It checks to make sure you're typing it correctly. And then you move on to the next thing, and it will do the same thing. Yes. Unlike most terminals, uh, if you hit the question, you hit shift slash, which opens the question mark, it'll give you a list of uh, options. Yes, of it will tell you everything you can start, every command you can start doing in that mode. And when you're stuck, that is your saving grace. Absolutely. 
So when you're going in between these different modes, the best thing that you can do is look to the left and see what mode you're already in. So um, we start out with the, the user exec prompt. So in this case, they put a password on it, so you have to have a password to be able to get in. You're going to do that on pretty much every lab we do in here, just because it's a good safety practice to get into. Um, so they started in user exec mode, they hit enable, now they have another password to get to where they can actually configure things. So there's two passwords on this device. You got a password to even see configurations, then a password to change configurations. Um, if you want to get out of that mode, you can say disable and go back to the other one. Okay. So just watch that symbol to the left. If you're trying to configure something in user exec mode, again, it's not going to work. You've got to get in the other mode. But it's not going to come out and say, hey, you're in the wrong mode. It's just going to say that command can't be issued or something really generic. So uh, if you're trying to enter a command and you can't, just check your privilege, literally. Um, so going in between these different modes, here's some examples. Um, if you'll notice, especially in this second graphic where they say configure terminal, they go into the configuration mode and it says end with control Z. So if you want to get out of that mode, you can do two things. You can type exit and it'll take you back up to the, the level you were at before. Or you can hit, hold down control and tap Z on the keyboard and it does the same thing. In this bottom example, they're going to configure terminal. Then they say, I want to configure this specific console line, ports 0 through 4. That's five ports, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then it's saying, OK, I want that to be on this interface. And then the end gets it back out of there. So exit, end, control Z, all these things get you out. I should really say there's three things that you can do that get you out. So when you're entering commands in Cisco IOS, this is kind of what it looks like. The prompt is the part that tells you what device you're in and what mode you're in. Okay. So whether we see the swish, the, the greater than or the hashtag, however you want to say that, um, the command is show, then there's a space, and then there's an argument. So um, this is just the way these commands are arranged and the way that there's always this perfect kind of structure. So it's, here's the prompt, what do you want it to do, and then what's the variable part of it that may change, like an IP address. So looking at those, here's an example of that. Um, the ping is something that's in boldface. It's something you actually have to type in, and it has to look just like that for it to work. Um, something in italics is an argument or something that you're going to supply. So I can ping anything. Ping is just going to check a response to see if something is responding to me. But in this case, I'm pinging that specific address. Bonus points if you know what that address is. Anybody? I totally don't expect you to. I just want to see if anybody knows. No. That's the loopback. That's the loopback address. That's the thing that you ping to make sure that you can communicate. We'll get into that. There's some help features in iOS. Um, the first thing that it has to do, this, it's basically the help is context sensitive. So whatever your command you're doing, you can type a um, question mark behind it, hit enter, and it's going to say, here's all the things that start with those letters. So if you're looking for a command, but you kind of, you remember the first part of it, but you don't want to remember some of the other parts, you can do that to be able to um, help you guide you through your way. So when you lost the question mark, um, we'll help guide you through what the possible things are that start with those letters. So like there's lots of commands that start with IP. So you could type in IP question mark and it would give you a list of all the commands that start with IP. That's helpful. In this instance, they're using the clock. So the clock has a whole bunch of arguments behind it. There's lots of things you can do with the clock setting. So instead of having to remember every single one, you can just type in clock question mark and it'll tell you all the things you could possibly do with that. That helps a little bit. So this will give you some commands. Um, it will also tell you if you type something in incorrectly. Sometimes it will give you a little bit of an idea of what you did wrong. So in the top left, we see clock set. They, they started the command out correctly, but they didn't actually say what to set the clock at. 
So that command won't work because it's not complete. Um, switch um, pound C is ambiguous because there's not enough information there to even get Cisco to understand what you were trying to do because C is just a letter. Um, if they did C question mark, they would get a list of all the commands that started with C, but they didn't do that. Um, there's also invalid input. So it'll tell you, there'll be a little caret symbol, that's what that little <coughs> upward, area, uh, upward arrow thing is, of saying that specific part that you typed in is not correct. All the rest is, but that one part <coughs> isn't. So as you go through and do packet tracers, it's going to give you lots of clues to help you get along. Um, so if you didn't give it enough to work with, if you typed in um, 2600 o'clock, that's not a valid time. So it's smart enough to to understand things like that. There's some hot keys and shortcuts. Again, especially if you're a keyboard person, you will appreciate these because they make it much, much quicker to be able to do things. So the big one is tab. So if you tap in C-O-N-F-T-E-R and hit tab, it'll say configure terminal and it'll complete things from you. Uh, one of them is, we'll talk about is show running configuration. That shows the running configuration of the switch and everything the way it is just then. If you type show run and hit tab, it's just going to show you everything. You don't have to type in the whole thing. Um, so that's a big one. Um, so it fills in things. There's um, control R to redisplay a line. Control A moves to the beginning. Um, control Z kind of breaks out of that mode and into a different one. I'm not going to read through all those. But um, control C, if you get into something that um, you didn't mean for it to do and it starts to try to do some really long process, um, you can hit control C, just like in programming, it breaks you out of a loop. This breaks you out of that mode or whatever it's trying to do. Um, and you're going to have different labs that's going to demonstrate things like that. But that can help you tremendously. So let's talk about some of the basic ways that we configure devices. That's all the things that we, all the commands and all the modes we use, but let's talk about what we actually do to configure a device. So the very first thing that we do is we give it a name. We can't just call everything switch. If we're in a real production environment, everything has to have a name that actually means where it is or what it is, right? So in this example, we've got a three-floor building. Well, we want them to be called the switch on floor one, the switch on, on floor, two, uh, floor two, and the switch on floor three. So that if something breaks, we know which one it is, mm -hmm. right? So we have to give it some sort of meaningful name, and that is the host name command. So host names should start with a letter. They shouldn't have spaces. They should end with a letter or a digit. Uh, they should use only letters, digits, and dashes, and they have to be less than 64 characters in length. As long as the name you're typing in meets all that criteria, you can name a switch or a router or a firewall that name. Um, so by default, devices just come in as the word switch or router. Uh, but we want to give it something more descriptive. So, how do we configure a host name? Well, first you go in to configure the terminal because you're telling it, hey, I want to do something to this. So that means you have to put in configure terminal. And then once you get into it, you're just going to type host name space and then the name. And then hit enter. And that's it. And you can see when they did that, um, it changed the host name over on that left hand side on that bottom line to switch or one, which is what it wanted. So that's simple enough. There's another command to write down for you, the host name. We also want to secure it so just not anybody that can get to that switch or knows the IP address of that switch, we'll talk about that in a second, can access it. So to do that, we want to secure access to the device. So the exec mode was just for, user exec mode was for looking at things, not configuring things. Privileged exec mode is for configuring things. We talked about that. Uh, but we can make it so no one can even see what the device set up is by securing that user mode. And if we secure privilege exec mode, they certainly can't change anything. They would have to know the password to be able to do that. So um, the best practice when you're configuring anything is to secure both those modes and secure Telnet. Based on what I've told you about Telnet, why would we want to secure Telnet? So they can't remote in. So they can't remote in, absolutely. And so they can't see any traffic. Um, if they were to tell that in, they might be able to see what other people are configuring or doing on the switch. We don't want them to do that either. So um, we would also want to encrypt all the password and then provide some kind of legal notification. 
So what you're seeing there on the left are going to be the things that we talk about today. The other commands that we're going to talk about. So configuring a password. Um, the first one is the privilege exec password example. So in this one they've said configure terminal, enable secret class. So in that case, class is the password. The password in this class is always going to be Cisco or class. Obviously, that's not a really good choice for a password, but it's something that is easy to remember. Um, so in that instance, they have set the password class on that piece of equipment for, you, for privileged exec mode. So no one can get into that to change anything. The second one is for the console port. So they're putting a password on the console line zero. And you will do, we will do labs about that um, that will make more sense about the different lines and what they mean. Um, and then there's a VTY line where they've done the same thing. You can see it's kind of the same. Here's the thing I want to put a password on. Here's the password. Um, log in, exit. It kind of tends to be the same kind of thing. So when something is encrypted, it's not in plain text written out. The device knows what it is. But if somebody was to come in and say, hey, show me the run-in configuration, they wouldn't see the password spelled out right there in plain text. Because if that's your password on that switch, maybe it's your password on other switches, and then bad things can happen. So when you use that enable secret command, um, you're saying um, encrypt that password. So somebody, if they come in and see it, they don't just see my password, not in plain text. Um, if someone's looking over your shoulder, they don't see the password. Everybody's happy. Um, this is the same as far as the console and the VTY, VTY. These are keeping people from actually gaining access to the room the switch is in, plugging into it, and then being able to console into it. Um, so that's just uh, physical security. When you're encrypting passwords, another command that you would want to write down, service space password dash encryption. So that encrypts all of the passwords that might show up on the screen. So you can see in here we say password, and it's got seven space and a whole bunch of numbers and letters. That's the encrypted version, right? That's obviously not the password they picked, but that's what it looks like on the screen. A banner message is basically a legal CYA. You all know what CYA means, right? You don't have to say it. Just nod. Okay. Cover your assets, right? So this is a technical way to do that. So a banner message is something that when someone tries to get into the switch, it pops up and says something, you know, legally menacing, essentially. Like, unauthorized use of this switch is prohibited. Um, so this is, if someone were to break into that switch and to cause havoc, and it was taken to a court of law, they could say, well, we said in the beginning, don't use this switch if you're not an authorized user, and they weren't an authorized user. So there have actually been court cases where if somebody put in there, welcome to switch floor one, uh, they said, well, you welcomed them in, so they didn't break the law. Um, and that seems a little silly, but hey, that's, that's technology. We've got we've to CYA as much as we can. So that's the thing that's going to pop up. And here you see in the orange text, this is a secure system authorized access only. So that would be the thing that popped up when anyone tried to access it in any way, just to let them know that they're not supposed to be there if they're not an authorized user. Uh, for example, another message you might see is to be accessed by authorized administrators only. Violators will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. You just really want to see if that scares them away. Um, if you change something, um, you're going to have to save it. Otherwise, when the device restarts, the changes you made won't be there. right? So we've got two different configuration files. There's the startup configuration file. Uh, that's all the things that happen when it starts up, right? Then there's the running configuration. So you start with the startup configuration. You make changes. Then you have the running configuration. It's the one that's running right then. If you want that running configuration to be the one that starts up, like you change something, you have to save the running configuration to the startup configuration. We will do labs on that. Um, but basically think about it as something on a computer that's stored in RAM. If you don't save that to the hard disk in some way, if that device uh, restarts or the power gets shut off, whatever's in RAM is gone because RAM is temporary. So the running configuration is temporary. We need to store it on the hard disk, which is the startup.
If you want to restore a device to the previous configuration it had, um, you can copy the startup configuration to the running. So let's say you make some changes in the running configuration and you do something wrong. Or you do something to the point where you can't figure out how to go back and fix it. You can use copy startup config running config. Use that command um, to basically nix all your changes. All your changes go away. Yeah. Um, you can also use what we call the reload command. Um, if you mess up a command while you're working on a device, you can reload it by restarting your computer. So one of the things you might say, this doesn't make any sense. Why would someone want to type all this stuff in? We have GUIs for this now. I'm not disagreeing with you. But I will say that um, one of the great things about this is you can write a configuration file, or you can configure a piece of equipment, and then save that configuration file, and then go deploy it on other pieces of equipment, which is very, very powerful, especially from a central administration standpoint. Everybody has the same configuration, and you don't have to go line by line by line and make it. So this is one of the things that with PuTTY you can do is you can capture that into a text file and then go take PuTTY, put it on another computer connected to a switch, and then load that again. So you do have a way to kind of administrate those. Um, this is also a form of a backup, really. So if somebody does something to your switch, there's an attack or something on it, uh, and they mess up your configuration, you can just go reload the backup that you had, and then you're back in business. So just here's a little bit more about um, enabling session logging. So you can get um, a log file that contains the running of the startup config of that device. Um, you can name the log something different. be disabled after you've done it you turn it off okay good heavens that's enough of command line for today let's talk a little bit about addressing schemes so for anything that needs to talk on the network it needs an IP address um, if it wants to talk to anybody else it needs an IP address so this is what an IP address is we need them for computers printers VoIP phones security cameras smartphones handheld devices absolutely anything that needs to get on the internet needs an IP address. So, what is an IP address? We use what we call dotted decimal notation. And if you look over here in the IP address section over on the right, under this heading, configuring a static IP address on a host, um, dotted decimal notation is what that, that specific look is called. The numbers that can be in each what we call octet, there's four octets, <coughs> four groups. Um, the number zero through 255 can be there. We'll talk more about why they picked those numbers later on. Um, so for example, in this one, that's 192.168.1.10 is the way we would read that with dots in between. Um, the subnet mask 255.255.255.0 tells us what subnet it's in. We'll talk more about that in previous chapters, uh, or in, in, in chapters in the future. Um, but this is an example of what IP addresses look like, and on the host, this is where we go to find them. So, communication on a network depends on end user devices, network and interfaces, and all the cables that connect them. So, if we have a cable connected somewhere, it's connected into what we call an interface. Um, so, the different types of media you can see listed down kind of at the bottom, we've got copper media, which can be um, the RJ45 Ethernet cables that are connected to all of our workstations. That can also be like coax cable that hooks up your cable TV if you've got that. We've got fiber optic cables that are really, really expensive um, and used a lot by internet service providers. And then we've got uh, wireless. So we've got several different means, as we talked about a little bit in Chapter 1. Um, there's different reasons you would pick one over the other in different instances, um, but the switches that we're going to be configuring have physical ports to connect to, but they also have what we call a switch virtual interface. So each port on the switch has an IP address because each port has wire in it that's connected to some <coughs> device at the other end, right? But if we want a, that whole switch to be able to be consoled into, we have to have a thing to call it, right? We can't just be like, configure that switch. We can for configuration purposes, but if we want to do more to it, as we'll do in later chapters, we have what we call the switch virtual interface. 
which is an IP address that we assign to all the ports on the switch. It's just a way to access the whole device instead of mentioning one specific port on it. So instead of changing 24 ports, just, just change the whole device. That is just a way to talk to a switch. For end devices, we can manually configure IP addresses. So the windows that you're seeing, if you were to go to the network and sharing center and go to change adapter properties, um, and then choose the adapter, which is probably going to be a local area network adapter, you see. That's great. So that screen is where we go to change. Um, and we will do that in packet transfers, how we change IP address information. Either we can put it in manually if we know it, or we can just say, obtain that address automatically. And this works if you have a DHCP server. A DHCP server hands out IP information. So you have to know which one you have. The way that you figure out what your IP information is, is you use what we call the IP config command. So show me the IP configuration of this computer. And you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. And you can see it's got IPv4 address, subnet mask, default gateway. We're going to be using all those things throughout this class. Uh, but that is the IP config command, uh, very popular among network administrators. Uh, the switch virtual interface, if you're going to make that command, you can see these commands, they start kind of piling up a little bit. Um, so first you would go in and configure the terminal. Then you're going to say interface VLAN 1. We'll talk about VLANs. But um, you're saying, here I'm making a new interface, essentially. And that interface is called VLAN 1. Then you're going to assign IP information to it and say no shutdown. No shutdown means enable this. So here's all the commands, now enable it. And then you get out of that mode. And we'll be doing that in a lab as well. So if you want to look to see what addresses all these interfaces or all these ports have, you would use the show IP interface brief command. And it's going to show you the interface, if it has an address, and is it up or down? Um, so if the port's down and you can't talk to it, that means maybe when you did your configuration, you didn't say no shutdown at the end, and it didn't get enabled. Um, so this just kind of shows the condition of all the interfaces on the switch um, and lets you know a little bit of information about it. A ping is an end-to-end -end connectivity test. So a ping is, is very, very often used if you can't access something on the network. The first thing you do is ping it and see, can you make a connection with it? And if you can't, then you troubleshoot based on that. If you can, then you've kind of got a whole different set of problems. So the ping is what we use for that. So in this case, we're typing ping and then an IP address. So um, they already know what the address of that resource is, whatever it is. And they're basically saying, can I establish communication with this? And in both instances here, they are establishing complete communication because you can see packet sent, received, and lost. And there's zero packet loss. Um, so they know that they can communicate with that address. test the connections between all of the devices as well as the IP address assignments, I'll use the ping command. To do this, I'll click on PCA, click on the command prompt, and I'll begin by pinging switch S1. I'll type in ping 192.168.1.2 and see if I can get a reply. All right, the first request timed out but the last three requests, I received replies. If I reissue the command, you can see that I'm getting replies from switch S1. I'll also try to ping switch S2 at 192.168.1.3. And you can see I also get replies. So I verified that I can ping from PCA to switch S1, from PCA to switch S2, and now I'll attempt to ping PCB at 192.168.1.11. I got echo replies from PCB indicating 
that I have end-to-end -end connectivity all the way from PCA to PCB. It's a good idea to test the connection from the other side by pinging from PCB to PCA to verify that the communication goes both ways. If for some reason the pings had failed and I was using real PCs, I'd also want to double check my firewall settings and make sure that I had my Windows firewall turned off. Windows firewall will block ping ICMP echo requests by default. On a real network, if you can ping one way, for instance, let's say from one PC to another, but when you try to ping the opposite way, the pings fail, that indicates that one of the two PCs has their Windows firewall activated. That's an overview of Cisco ILS. Um, some initial settings that you're probably going to do on every configuration you do in this class because they're just standard things they want to get you used to doing. Um, and then IP addressing, a little bit about that. So 